I would like to do in this presentation is focus on New Zealand perceptions of Baron Pierre de Coubertin, founder of the modern Olympic Games and International Olympic Committee president between 1896 and 1925. As reflected in papers past, the digital repository of New Zealand newspapers. I will be focusing on his construction as an Anglophile amateur and his links with prominent New Zealand athletes. Although de Coubertin has generally, and on the whole correctly, been depicted as an Anglophile, he was not uncritical of Britain. Indeed, his earliest mention in a New Zealand newspaper appears to be in an 1889 editorial of the Auckland Star, a populist afternoon newspaper which focused on proposals for imperial federation, something de Coubertin saw as making Britain stronger and therefore potentially a danger to France. The death of de Coubertin on 2nd September 1937 was widely, if fleetingly, reported in New Zealand newspapers. Most acknowledged his role as the founder of the modern Olympic Games and president of the International Olympic Committee, but others such as the Wairarapa Daily Times, focused on both his scholarly and literary achievements. The article reporting his death in the New Zealand Herald, Auckland's leading morning newspaper, was relatively extensive compared to other newspapers and reflected the general perception of de Coubertin as an Anglophile Frenchman who promoted and upheld the proper values of sport. It approvingly noted that he had studied at English and American universities and was an admirer of the ancient Greeks, the progenitors of the classical education, which was the basis of the English public schools, where the cult of athleticism practiced by the gentleman amateur which underpinned his vision of the modern Olympic Games, originated. He was credited with having overcome innumerable difficulties in the process of resuscitating the Olympic Games, thereby epitomizing the pluck and perseverance the English public school system prided itself in teaching. The generally favourable perceptions of de Coubertin in New Zealand stood in marked contrast to the at best ambivalent attitudes towards France expressed prior to World War I. Alistair Watts, in his master's thesis, identified a persistent and pervasive negative sentiment towards France and matters French in New Zealand in the period prior to the First World War. And despite tens of thousands of New Zealand troops serving in France during World War I, these attitudes did not, what's argued in his doctoral thesis, notably change in the interwar period. Indeed, as a number of historians have observed, participation in World War I strengthened rather than undermined New Zealand's imperial connections. De Coubertin's lifespan largely coincided with what James Billich calls the recolonization of New Zealand by Britain between 1880 and 1960, in which New Zealand consciously positioned itself as a better Britain and aligned itself with Britain economically, culturally, intellectually, and politically. Alignment with Britain did not, however, 
mean subservience. New Zealanders, Balich argued, saw themselves as junior shareholders in the empire and therefore had a self-interest in its maintenance. There are, I think, two principal explanations for the generally favourable New Zealand perceptions of de Coubertin. First, he was generally presented as an Anglophile, and his support of amateurism in particular resonated with the avowedly amateur outlook of most New Zealand sports administrators. Second, the personal connections of de Coubertin with key New Zealand athletes, notably Leonard Cuff and Arthur Porritt, exemplified the global reach New Zealanders believed they enjoyed, courtesy of their access to imperial networks. For most New Zealanders, to the extent that they did read about de Coubertin, it was in reference to sport. The first mention of de Coubertin in a sporting context was in 1890, in an article entitled Three games and gymnastics in the press, a Christchurch morning newspaper. The article noted the Coubertin's enthusiasm for the way sport was taught in Britain's public schools and asserted all de Coubertin wrote on football and baseball was set forth in strains worthy of Tom Brown a reference to Thomas Hughes's novel, Tom Brown's School Days, the classic evocation of sport in Britain's public schools. It was not just the physical development aspects of British sport that appealed to de Coubertin. New Zealand newspapers reporting on the early stages of the Olympic Games frequently cited his support for amateurism. The dominant ideology of the Olympic Games from its inception until the early 1990s. These views were reinforced when de Coubertin's successor as president of the International Olympic Committee, the Belgian Count de Bayer Lotour, visited New Zealand in 1932. The New Zealand Olympic Committee asked de Bayer Lotour to convey to de Coubertin their deep sense of appreciation of all he had done in promoting the games and ideals of sportsmanship. Subsequent newspaper articles positioned de Coubertin as much as a classical Greek and by extension British figure as a Frenchman. A Stratford Evening Post article published during the 1936 Olympic Games, praised de Coubertin for continuing the purported Greek ideals of amateurism in sport. In what may have been an editorial juxtaposition, the article appeared alongside a report of golf professionals complaining about meagre prize money in their sport. New Zealand newspapers also reported on the burial of his heart at Olympia, noting that this was done in partial fulfilment of his wishes. New Zealand sports administrators prided themselves on their amateur ethos. One newspaper report from 1924 approvingly quoted the manager of the visiting Chinese university's football team, calling New Zealand sports people the most amateur country in the world. The interwar period saw a renewed assertion of amateurism in New Zealand amidst a wider crusade against perceived immorality, which James Belich has called the great tightening. And in this context, de Coubertin's staunch advocacy of amateurism accrued him considerable favour among many New Zealanders. In addition to his depiction as an Anglophile amateur, de Coubertin's personal connections with New Zealand athletes such as Leonard Cuff 
reflected the global reach imperial sporting networks offer to New Zealanders. And in a sense, they reinforced an already existing national story that New Zealand punched above its weight in world sport. Leonard Cuff met de Coubertin in 1892, when he managed a group of New Zealand athletes, of whom he himself was one, on a tour of Britain and Europe. Cuff was a leading amateur athlete who represented New Zealand in cricket and athletics. The New Zealand team competed at a Paris athletic festival the Coubertin organised, and Cuff and he inspected the facilities together. Cuff was subsequently nominated by de Coubertin as one of the 12 founding members of the International Olympic Committee. And he served on this body until he tendered his resignation in 1905. An article by Letters in Jobling and scholarship from Jeff Coey suggest that Cuff's selection was due to de Coubertin wanting to present the International Olympic Committee as a truly international body. In addition, Cuff's multifaceted skills as an amateur sportsman marked them out to de Coubertin as an ideal type of sporting amateur. Cuff, it needs to be pointed out, was not particularly close to de Coubertin. He met him only once and appears to have written only five times to de Coubertin during his 10 years on the International Olympic Committee. Nevertheless, his selection symbolised recognition for New Zealand on the international stage. A number of New Zealanders have since followed in his footsteps. Perhaps most notably, Whanganui-born Arthur Porritt, who won a bronze medal in the 100 metres at the 1924 Olympic Games and served on the International Olympic Committee between 1934 and 1967. Here too, there was a link to de Coubertin. De Coubertin presented Arthur Porritt with his bronze medal after the 100 metre sprint at the 1924 Olympic Games. And Porritt very much supported his ideals of the amateur games as a vehicle for promoting peace later lamenting that the nationalism he had seen at the 1976 Games, and he decried this as contrary to de Coubertin's ideals. New Zealand's contacts with de Coubertin coincided with its formative and somewhat ambivalent phase of involvement with the Olympic Games. On the one hand, Cuff was a founding member of the IOC, and this gave him considerable standing. On the other hand, New Zealand did not participate in its own right at the Olympic Games until 1920. A select few athletes competed alongside Australians as part of an Australasian team in 1908 and 1912. And one reason for the ambivalence towards the Olympic Games was the feeling among some Australians and New Zealanders that as British subjects, they ought to compete under the banner of Great Britain. And even when New Zealand did compete in its own right at the Olympic Games from 1920, its teams were very small in number during the interwar period. Four athletes in 1920 and 1924, 10 in 1928, 21 in 1932, and seven in 1936. 
Some of those who did attend, including 1936 gold medalist in the 1500 metres, Jack Lovelock, thought the games had become too nationalistic and commercialised, and they favoured instead participation in the British Empire Games, the forerunner of the Commonwealth Games, which had been established in 1930, precisely because of concerns over excessive nationalism and commercialism at the Olympic Games. New Zealand's ambivalent engagement with the Olympic Games partially reflected a wider trend of renewed imperialism in both sport and politics during the interwar period. It was during this time that New Zealand rugby came firmly into line with its British counterpart, abandoning after 1930 its wing forward position and adopting international rules regarding scrummaging and going away from its previous sanctioning of localised rules and competitions. And this renewed imperialism was also seen politically. The Statute of Westminster, which granted all dominions full rights of self-government in 1931, was viewed warily in New Zealand, and it was not formally adopted until 1947. It is in this wider context that de Coubertin stands out as one of the few French figures consistently represented favourably in New Zealand. And that may well owe something to his construction as an Anglophile amateur who exhibited the best ideals of the classical scholar. Moreover, the recognition he gave New Zealand by selecting Leonard Cuff as a founding member of the International Olympic Committee and the presence of a number of New Zealanders on that body following his selection was testament to the global reach New Zealanders believed they enjoyed, courtesy of their access to imperial and international sporting networks. Although French by birth, de Coubertin was in this way co-opted into this network and by virtue of promoting Britain's sporting values and awarding prestigious positions to members of its empire, his French identity was elided and it became incorporated into a wider imperial and New Zealand story of the promotion of amateur sport. Thank you very much 